Welcome to the topic of vector field visualization. Today, I'm going to talk about a texture synthesis technique called line integral convolution that will produce flow textures that allow people to visualize vector field data. This image shows an example of the output produced by the line integral convolution algorithm. Different from the traditional flow line method, line integral convolution does not produce line primitives. Instead, it produces a texture where pixels along the flow direction have coherent value that will make it very easy to visualize the flow direction everywhere in the domain. Main application of line integral convolution is to visualize static two-dimensional vector fields or flows near the body of the model in a three-dimensional space. It emphasizes the flows on the surface, so it is also considered as a method to visualize surface flows. One unique property of line integral convolution is that it can produce images very similar to the result of experimental oil flow visualization, where you also show the patterns on the surface of an object. It is a method that can be used to overcome the drawback of traditional flow visualization techniques, in particular, the need to decide the C locations to compute the flow lines. In the line integral convolution method, you do not need to determine the seeds because it will produce flow textures everywhere in the domain. This slide shows an experimental oil flow visualization technique which highlights the flow patterns on a surface. Using the line integral convolution method, it will produce similar flow patterns on the surface of an object. So I mentioned that the line integral convolution can overcome some of the problems in the traditional flow line based method. What are the problems? So if you consider using string lines to visualize a static flow field, the first decision you have to make is where to place the seat. Obviously, if you do not place the seat at a location that will show the important flow feature, you're not going to generate useful visualization. Determining the seat location in a large-scale vector field is actually a non-trivial problem. Typically, what is done is by trial and error, or you need to have a prior knowledge about your data. If you simply place flow line C at every grid location in the field, because the space between grid points can vary, you are going to create visualization that highlights the density of the grid points, which are not necessarily related to the underlying flow feature. Also, you need to determine the length of flow lines. If the flow lines are too long, you may create cloudy images, but if the flow lines are too short, you may not be able to have a good coverage of the domain. So this shows an example of using string lines to visualize a two-dimensional flow field. As you can see, the density of the flow lines is uneven across this surface. On the one hand, there's a lot of white area. You cannot see the flow direction. On the other hand, there are areas you have very dense flow lines to the point it is very difficult to identify individual flow direction. This slide shows a comparison between using the traditional flow line techniques and the output produced by the line integral convolution technique. As you can see, the image on the left produces artifacts related to the location of the grid point. On the other hand, in the image on the right, you show a continuous flow direction across the surface of the object. So let's look at the line integral convolution algorithm in detail. It was originally proposed by Cabral and Leiden in CGRAB 1993. The line integral convolution algorithm takes the white noise image and also a two-dimensional vector field as input. Then for every output pixel, we are going to perform convolution. Basically, it's the weighted average of the white noise and generate the output pixel value. Here are the steps we are going to apply to every pixel in the output image. From each pixel, we take the vector field and then we compute four and backward string lines. Along the string line path, we look at the input noise image and then we perform the weighted sum by multiplying a weight to each of the noise image pixels along the string line path. And this is the equation we use to multiply. So the first red box, the f function, represents the input noise pixel values and pi are the pixels along the four string line. For every pixel value in the noise image f of pi, we take a ceiling because we 
truncate the floating point position to integer position to get the actual pixel value. We multiply by the weight hi. This h is so-called convolution kernel, which is just the weight assigned to pixel. And then we do the same thing for the backward string line. Here again, the f function is the input noise pixel values. pi prime are the pixel locations on the backward string line. And then we multiply each noise pixel value by a weight h prime, which again defined by the convolution kernel. We add those weighted noise image value together and then normalized by the sum of the total weights, which will produce the value of the output pixel. So why this works? This is because if you repeat this process at every pixel, because their value are computed from a similar set of input noise pixel, pixel value along the string line will be highly correlated, but the pixel values between the adjacent string lines are randomized. Now let's look at the convolution kernel. That is the way you assign to the forward and backward noise pixel values along the string lines. There are multiple ways that you can do it. One is to simply use a box filter. You assign an even weight to every pixel along the string line. So here, assuming the forward string line has a length of L, then the weight is going to be 1 over L. And same thing for the backward string line. Or you can highlight the value close to the originating pixel that you use to compute the string lines. So you can use a tech filter. So that is, if pixels are close to the starting position of the string line, you assign higher weight. And when they are farther away, you assign lower weight. Another more sophisticated method is to use a periodical filter. In the original secret paper, Cabral and Leiden proposed to use this windowed hanging ripple function. Essentially, you have a ripple function, and then you multiply the function by a Gaussian, and then you create this periodical filter. And you can evaluate the value on this resulting function, and use the value that is the height in this diagram as the way to assign the pixel value. If you want to know the detail about this window hanging ripple function, you can refer to the original 1993 secret paper. And one good thing about using this periodical filter is that you can create animation. Remember the kernel is produced by multiply a periodical function by a Gaussian-like window. You can shift the function by change the face. Essentially, you are shifting the function forward, and then you create different kernel as shown in the bottom of the slides. And you can apply this different kernel to the same vector field, the same noise. And when you display the sequence of the output, you will create animation. This slide shows some example images that was originally presented in the CGREP 1993 papers. One thing to note is that the same algorithm can be applied to three-dimensional volume data. So what you need to do is you compute 3D string line, and you provide a noise volume, and then you perform the same weighted average of the noise voxel value from the input. The lower right corner is the result of volume render three-dimensional leak output. This slide shows some references. The first paper is the original line integral convolution paper. And the second and third paper are techniques that can use GPUs to generate results very similar to the original leak output. OK, this concludes the lecture of using line integral convolution algorithm to generate textures that can highlight flow directions.